Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Junk History, the show where I obsess over toys, posters, CDs, uh, trapper keepers probably, and other memorabilia from decades past in an attempt to distract myself from thinking about how much closer I am to death than I was the first time I saw them. I then pay that obsession forward to you, the luckiest viewers on the planet, by explaining why these trinkets, curios, and objects to art are culturally important, and how they went on to reshape the world as we know it. Today's artifact is... This Top Gun home video cassette, released in 1987. Top Gun is a movie about a group of hotshot fighter pilots competing for the spot of most handsomely reckless white man in aviation school during the jingoistically orgiastic throes of Cold War America. It taught us everything we needed to know about the Navy through the dual lens of Kenny Loggins power pop and Rick Rossovich's glistening muscles. <laughs> Top Gun was dropped on an America that couldn't get enough of watching attractive young people destroy Russians and went on to become the biggest movie of 1986, introducing an already successful Tom Cruise to the level of fame that allows you to worship aliens and have your wise edition for you by committee. And what's a 30 year old VHS tape have to do with any of that? Nothing at all, but it has everything to do with a much more important historical chapter, that of the home video market. You see, in the mid 1980s, home video was still pretty new. The idea of people being able to own copies of their favorite movies and watch them whenever the hell they felt like it in the privacy of their own house, basement apartment, or panic room wasn't introduced until the late 70s, and it got off to a pretty slow start. In July of 1986, the summer Top Gun was released in theaters, a VHS copy of Back to the Future, Return of the Jedi, or Rocky IV would have cost you 80 goddamn dollars. Adjusted for inflation, that's $180 per video. It's like heroin prices, how, how much is heroin? Okay, um, how many heroines could I get for a copy of Jewel of the Nile? Death. That's, that's too much heroin. And to be clear, those films weren't the exception. Videos used to be priced like textbooks. In fact, the home video market was pretty identical to the textbook industry. You see, before VHS, when people weren't able to just buy their own copies of their favorite movies, theatrical re-releases were a huge part of Hollywood's revenue stream. Popular blockbuster films like Jaws, Star Wars, The Godfather, and E.T., not to mention every child-punishing fairy tale Disney has ever animated into cinematic existence, were regularly thrown back into theaters every few years. If you really loved those movies, the only way you ever got to watch them again was by waiting around until they burst back into your local cineplex, buying another ticket. So when home video finally became a thing, studios set the price super high to account for all the money they were gonna lose on future theatrical re-releases. Just like with textbooks, which charge you at the ass because they know they're gonna lose money when you turn around and sell that book used to future students who can't or won't shell out a Kingsley Ransom for a new copy. Hollywood was trying to compensate for all the return of the Jedi tickets you would no longer be buying now that you owned your very own copy of the worst Star Wars movie of the 1980s. Every decade has their own now. So to cushion the financial blow home video dealt to the re-release market and to combat the burgeoning field of movie piracy that home video was only too happy to create, the majority of VHS movies were priced between $80 and $100, with some skewing higher. Adjusted for inflation, that's $200 in millennial bucks, which is more than you should spend on anything that can't be programmed to love you in return. According to the National Association of Theater Owners, the average movie ticket price in 1986 was $3.71. So the average videotape was covering the cost of 24 tickets. Most people don't go to the theater to see 24 different movies in one year, let alone the same one two dozen times. Even accounting for a movie being re-released once every two years, they're still assuming that everyone who bought a copy of Back to the Future would have otherwise continued to go watch Marty McFly attempt to delight Huey Lewis by playing the tiniest guitar ever built at least five times a decade for the next 50 years. <laughs> There's a fine line between minimizing loss and extortion, Tinseltown, and you just found it. Uh, in 1986. If you thought Hollywood overreacted to the death of the theatrical re-release as a debt-reducing leprechaun well they could dependably return to, they lost their f***ing minds when video rental became a thing. Buying movies has pretty much always been the same process. You go to a store, you give them a previously agreed upon stack of dollars, and they hand you a copy of Crocodile Dundee. But renting movies used to be way more complicated. When mom and pop stores first started renting movies, Hollywood responded in a manner that can only be described as Highly litigious, arguing that rentals violated the portion of a film's copyright that states it can't be screened in public by freaking randos. So the stores responded by making their customers join a rental club, sort of like a country club, and pay annual dues, which in some cases were upwards of $200. What's that in 2016, Duckets Ghostwriter? There were only like 100 video cassettes in existence in the early 80s. What thriftless goblin was renting movies at that price? We've gotta return some videotapes. And then Top Gun came out. Other huge box office hits had already been released on VHS at this point, but while your Indiana Joneses and your Axel Foley's might cost you $40, and your Returns of Your Jedi's would cost you 90 hard-earned space doubloons, Paramount decided to sell the biggest hit of 1986, and adjusted for inflation, still one of the biggest movies ever, for $26.95. 
the lowest any feature film had ever been priced. And they did that by front-loading each VHS copy of Top Gun with a Diet Pepsi commercial, featuring a dangerous madman jeopardizing his life and a $40 million aircraft to drink a delicious cup of brown chemicals. To mitigate the financial loss they would incur by undercutting the theatrical re-release and rental markets by immediately selling Top Gun directly to consumers at a price they could actually afford, Paramount made a multi-million dollar deal with Pepsi that essentially translated into a tacit agreement with home video audiences. You can buy your very own copy of Top Gun, but you have to fast forward through this radical diet soda ad every time you watch it. It worked so well that Top Gun became the highest selling video cassette of all time at that time, which made Hollywood arch its collective eyebrows in the characteristically predatory expression we've come to expect from them. Immediately following the success of the Top Gun video, Pepsi went to Steven Spielberg and Universal to try and convince them to release E.T. on VHS. At the time, E.T. was the biggest blockbuster movie history, and they had made the decision to keep it out of the home video market so that they could just keep re-releasing it in theaters forever and ever until the end of time. Why kill the golden goose if you can keep strangling gilded eggs out of it? But Pepsi Pepsi threw a giant hat of money their way, which eventually led to E.T.'s release on home video, which included a $5 rebate from Pepsi, bringing the price down to $19.95, which is roughly what we expect to pay for movies to this day. Unless we're talking special editions with like collectible tins, or a T-Rex statue, or a Batman mask, or that one copy of Die Hard that comes with a little Nakatomi built. You know what? That's, that's a different thing whole different episode. In exchange for their fat stacks of Spielberg bribing cash, Pepsi got to use E.T. in some dope-ass soda commercials. Little my memory, he doesn't fly a jet in any of them. Other big 80s hits like Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade and Batman were willingly saddled with Diet Coke commercials so that they could immediately be sold to consumers at affordable prices. Batman had like five goddamn minutes of commercials at the beginning, including a desperate plea from Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck for you to buy a bunch of Warner Brothers merchandise. Not Batman merchandise, specifically merchandise for Warner Brothers The Film Studio. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, released a few months after Batman debuted on home video, also carried a commercial to mitigate its lower price point. This one was for Pizza Hut, which made thematic sense because any one of the Ninja Turtles would absolutely shove his dick into a pizza if the cheese wasn't so hot, and made good business sense because Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was a movie explicitly marketed to children, and children in the Twilight Ships passing that was the end of the 1980s and the dawn of the 1990s loved nothing more than going to Pizza Hut. The commercial itself was a song about going to Pizza Hut after a Little League game. That's the most relatable situation you can present a child, because odds are most of them were watching this goddamn videotape after coming home from Pizza Hut after Little League. The only difference is the kid in the commercial won his game. We seem so alike, nameless boy. Now you're a stranger to me. Moving into the 90s and beyond, the strategy for the home video market has remained pretty much the same. Sell your movies for around $20, but toss a bunch of commercials on there and see what you can get away with. There are some exceptions to this. Once studios stopped fighting Blockbuster and its like over rentals, they began to treat a film's rental period as a reliable market and would stretch the amount of time between selling a home video copy for $100 and marking it down to a more consumer-friendly $20 or $30 as long as they possibly could, which was a lesson I learned when I tried to buy a copy of Terminator 2 the day it came out on video. Rentals essentially replaced the theatrical re-release market on Hollywood's tax returns, but now that everything's gone digital and cut out most of the middle, Middlemen, Hollywood is more than happy to rent or sell you a copy of everything they produce. And while the price of rentals can be all over the place, depending on a film's popularity and whether or not it's still playing in theaters, the price to own your favorite movie is still right around the $20 to $25 range established in 1987 by the Top Gun VHS and its ludicrous Diet Pepsi commercial. Thanks, Top Gun. Pour one out for Goose. Take my breath away! Hey, thanks for watching that video. If you want to subscribe, hit that big C in the middle, and if you want to watch more videos, hit one of the boxes on the right. Also, don't forget to hit the notification bell icon below so YouTube will notify you when we have a new video up. Thanks.